All right, so we're finishing our series, Why It Is Never Enough, and next week we will start into our Christmas series and going to uh, hopefully be a big encouragement, remind us of hope and um, all the things that are happening. But let me give you the series verse. Mark 8, 36 says this, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? And here's something I want you to know about temptation, and that's what we're going to talk about today. The reason it's called temptation is because it's... I just untied my shoe. The reason that it's called temptation is because it's not something you want to do. Okay, this is not going to last any longer. The good news is I'm telling an ADD story this morning, so it'll fit right in with this whole... I double-tied it, yeah. So, so here's the thing. We've all seen people who have destroyed their f- whole life with one bad choice. David is considered in the Bible a man after God's own heart, and yet... Even David, when put in the wrong situation at the wrong time with the wrong type of feedback, and we're going to talk about some practical ways to overcome temptation, gave in. Everyone struggles in some area. And I'm going to mention some things um, uh, today that I hope will help you. Now, I remember when I was about 8 to 10 years old going to a theme park called Carowinds. Has anybody in here ever been to Carowinds? You guys know where it's at. So Carowinds is between North and South Carolina. My grandmother lived in Fort Mill. We had property in Fort Mill, North Carolina, and we loved to go up there, and then we would go to Carowinds. And so <clears throat> we went to Carowinds, my cousins and my brother and I, and we were riding different rides. We got to ride all the roller coasters, uh, which is really funny because I don't ride roller coasters at all anymore. They make me instantly sick. I've ridden so many, I guess, that now my brain is like, nope, you're not getting on there anymore. I'm, and if you do, I'm just going to make you sick the rest of the day, so it's miserable. So I'm a great purse holder now for my wife. She loves roller coasters. And I'm like, honey, have a great time. I'll hold your purse for you. Have a great time. And um, then I go buy food. Anyway, so don't tell her. She might not be watching. But anyway, so um, we we went on the flume ride. There was a flume ride. And I don't know if you've been on. How many of you have ever been on one of those flume rides? You know what I'm talking about? Anybody at home? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, I see those hands inside the camera. So uh, anyway, so we're on the flume ride. And something inside of me, as we went down a couple of the dips, I looked over, and there was a little, like, fence. It wasn't really a, it was kind of a metal bars with a bar in between, and I guess it was just to keep the car there. And as I looked at that, I thought, I wonder if I could touch that. Just, (laughs) do you already know this story? I, I, I thought, I wonder if I could touch that on the way down. Part of me was like, I wonder if I can grab that. Now, now somebody topped my story by saying they actually got, tried to get out of the flume ride and their spouse had to pull them back in. So I wasn't that bad, right, Michelle? So, um, but, but what happened is as we, you don't tell me stuff right before church, that's what happened. So, so as, the, as it goes down a couple of times, I think I wonder if I can do it. And as I'm there, I just, I just, as we're going down, I mean, it is going who knows how fast. What is this thing, 30 miles an hour or something? I, I think, you know, I'm just going to touch it. So I reach my hand out. As soon as my hand touches the thing, it, of course, you know, about takes my arm off. My hand is numb the rest of the day. Of course, I don't tell my parents anything. I could have so easily lost this hand or this arm, or whatever. I mean, it would be like driving down the street and saying, hey, I want to hit that speed limit sign. You just don't do that, right? But something inside of me just pulled me towards that. And, and I was talking to somebody last night who also has a very hyperactive child, and, they, and I said, you know, one of the things about kids who are hyperactive or ADD or ADHD, and I was ADHD before there was ADHD. I was in high definition way before. So, so, one of the things is we love to touch and taste and smell. I mean, I've found myself getting gas, and, and after I get gas, I have a problem with going, I wonder if my hand smells. I mean, it's weird. It's just, who does? Of course it smells like gas, you know? And, and here's the thing about temptation. Just like a little ADD kid has a hard time sitting still, we all have this pull towards selfishness. And even after we become Christians and we surrender our life to Christ, we have this pull. And sometimes as Christians, it can can be in the form of looking righteous, wanting people to be impressed with our knowledge or, or the things that we know. It could be as simple as that. Sometimes it's judging people secretly in our minds. When we look at their Facebook post and we think, well, I wouldn't do that. And we do all kinds of things to build ourselves up. So here's what I'm going to talk about today. 
We fall into temptation for three main reasons that we're going to look at today when we look at the life of David. Uh, uh, Two main reasons of what we're going to talk about. But we always desire more. We tend to follow our lusts and pride. And then we forget that this world is temporary. The main thing I'm going to get to today is we can get refocused when we learn how to recognize sin in our lives. We all need to take the time to evaluate and say, God, is there anything in my heart Any judgmental attitude that's not right. So we first recognize it, and then we confess it, and then we receive forgiveness. And that really is the cycle that we should get in when it comes to making sure our heart's right with God. So, number one, it's easy to want more of the world. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 2. And in verse 15, it says this, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the father is not in them. Now, there's two main things that this is talking about. Number one is you can't pursue the world and call yourself a Christian. It talks in here about people who walk in darkness. And every once in a while, somebody says, well, how do I know that? I said, well, typically you don't know that about another person, but they can know that about themselves. Am I pursuing the world? Okay. But then the second thing is this. When you allow the pursuit of the world, even as a Christian, when you allow the pursuit of the world to become number one, and the pursuit of the world can be subtle. It can be just wanting, it could just be people pleasing. It could be trying to make other people happy and thinking it's your job for other people to be happy with you. It could be trying to impress people. It could be that blatant pride that we see where, 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 you know, we're just, you know, we know those people who are just so arrogant that we're like, oh my gosh, how do you not see it? And here's the truth. Whenever we slip into pursuing the world, we don't love those around us because we become selfish and self-centered. Anytime that you're online or you're watching Facebook or you're watching uh, TV even, if you're, if you're watching shows that pull you towards the world, Or you're watching things, I talked last night, you know, you're watching things that continually make you angry and frustrated because you're trying to control other people. Sometimes we have to put all those things away. Why? So that we don't pursue those things so that we can get still and say, God, I want to be filled with your love. Not with these other things the world is always trying to fill me with fear and anger and judgment and all those things. You know, Revelation chapter 2, it talks about the church of Ephesus. And, and basically what Jesus says to them is, you've left your first love. And if we're not careful, it is very easy for all of us to leave, leave our first love. You know, Rodney talked about the idea that, hey, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. But the truth is, sometimes even though we've made a decision, I want to serve the Lord, it's very easy to get distracted on the journey. <laughs> to say, God, I want to serve you, squirrel. God, I want to serve you. Ow! Right? And, and we get caught in something that we know hurts us. And yet we allow sin to do that. Listen to what happened to David in 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 3. And I'll give you three things that happened here. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war. I'll go back to that in a minute. David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. You know, he probably got up and he was like, you know, I feel like I have the Rona. That's what kids call it, by the way. You know, I gotta feel like I might have a cough. You know, I don't want to give anybody anything. So, you know, he found an excuse. You know, I'm, I'm feeling a little tired. And he did not go where he should have gone. That was the beginning of his problems. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. By the way, my dad used to say, nothing good happens after midnight. So, son, when you go out, you need to be home by midnight. And he was right. Nothing good happened after midnight. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent somebody to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, The Hittite. Now we're going to find out that Uriah was a godly man. Uriah, when he was called home, would not even go in to be with his wife. Because he said, I can't do that when my men are out there fighting. And yet David was in the wrong place. He was somewhere he shouldn't be. He should have been out with his men, but he wasn't. Listen, 
One of the things you're going to find out about temptation is some of you are more tempted in certain places than others. Some of you are going to struggle with being online. So it may be that you even need to uh, leave your computer in the kitchen. Or for some of you, you may, need to, you may be better off to throw your computer away and get off your computer and do without it. I know that's a huge thing. Jesus said, better take your eye out than lust. So, you know, for some of us, we need to get away from that. For some of us, we need to turn off that talk radio that's making us angry every day. For some of us, we need to be careful what news channels we're watching and feeding ourselves, and we find that we're gritting our teeth and we're angry. What is that? You're, you're wanting control. You're wanting power. So you get frustrated. You're in the wrong place. Do you hear me? Some of you years ago struggle with alcohol, and you think you've overcome it, so you go and visit a bar. <laughs> right? So you can't be around that, right? You fall right back into that. Be careful where you are. Don't put yourself in situations. I don't go to homes with women by themselves. I think over 70 was my, is my rule, though, you know, over 70. Wrong place. And then he was in the wrong time. It was late. He, he was tired. We're going to talk about that in a minute. It was small steps. It's never a big step that leads you to sin. It's just, I wonder what will happen if I touch this. Adam and Eve, right? I wonder what will happen if we just, let's just take a taste. Let's just, let's just try this. Let's just take, and, and what happens over time is it's a little step, and before you know it, you maybe, maybe you struggle with anger at certain things. Before you know it, you're an angry person. You act angry all the time. Maybe it's pride. You allow it to sneak in. Maybe it's comparison, and it just becomes normal. Maybe it's gossip. We all know somebody who talks about everybody. Did you know they don't know they do that? Why? Because it was a little step at a time. You know that grumpy neighbor that you have that yells at kids on their lawn? You know, Carl? You know, you know those people? I'm just teasing Carl. You, you know those people, right? They don't know they're that way. Why? They haven't looked at themselves. They've, it slowly happened. It's like the old story of the frogs in the kettle. Do you remember that story? You, know, you put them in the cool water and you heat it up. I always thought that was disgusting. All right, how to keep your love from straying. I'm going to give you three things. Number one, pay attention to your attention. What do you think about the most? What do you focus on the most? What gets your attention all the time? Is, if you have a problem with control, one of the things you'll notice is you're always trying to, even in your mind, tell people what to do. If you have a problem with, with uh, uh, envy of other people, you'll find yourself online going, how dare they have that and I don't have that? How dare that person got that promotion and I didn't? The things you struggle with, you will notice if you pay attention. And the Holy Spirit can speak to your heart about that. But you got to get still. The second thing is put up barriers to temptation. Don't put yourself in situations where it's going to pull you towards struggle. There's all kind of ways that you can be accountable to other people, that you can get people to help you if it's online. Sometimes for many of us, it's just turning off the TV. And then finally, make sure that you're spending time with growing believers. Like Rodney said earlier, we all struggle. We all stumble. But get with somebody who stumbles and doesn't say, oh, it's no big deal. But they say, you know what, I'm working on that in my life. God's working on me. Number two, lust and pride can cause failure. First John continues, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So in our flesh, our flesh is our appetites, our hungers, our desires. Sometimes food can be our sin. Sometimes we fall into just eating too much. I mean, it's just, it's just I'm so glad my kids ate all the cookies that I made. I made some delicious cookies. And, and they were gone by Thanksgiving night. It was awesome. They were just... Why? Why was that good? Because I probably would have at some point been walking by. You ever do this one? Right? And, and before you know it, you've eaten 17 cookies, right? Or a whole sleeve of Thin Mints, right? Our flesh, our appetites, and sometimes our appetites are towards lust. Sometimes our appetites are towards wanting more. Sometimes it's that nicer car. Our eyes can be drawn to comparison with everybody. You'll never be happy as long as you're comparing yourself. Pride sneaks in. Sometimes pride is just us wanting to be the best at something. Christian people struggle with people-pleasing. 
And, and it seems unselfish when they want to do everything for everyone. But the truth is, when you're trying to please other people all the time, that's actually selfish. Think about it. If anytime somebody doesn't acknowledge that you help them, that you get frustrated, then maybe you weren't really doing it for God. And I think God puts us in that place sometimes where no good deed goes unpunished in order to help us to check our motives. Then David sent a messenger to her. She came to him and he slept with her. And then it says she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Now, how did it get this far? By the way, this is just the first. We're only telling the first part of the story. How did it get this far? Well, David became prideful. He, he had had victories. He was now living in prosperity. He had it easy. So, so he just kind of became prideful. And then he became disobedient. He didn't go and do what he was supposed to do. By the way, if you want to do what's right, don't feel yourself into doing. Do yourself into feeling. Typically, they say that one of the easiest ways to get going is instead of, for example, let's say you want to clean your living room, okay? Well, there's two ways to do that. Number one, have people over, and then suddenly you'll be like, oh, i got to clean the living room, okay? But the second way is this. Just think of one small task that you need to do. Don't think of the whole living room. Think of one thing and take that first step in doing what's right. If you haven't been to church in forever, you know, some people watching at home, you haven't been to church in forever, and there's a reason maybe not to come now, but there'll come a time where you know you're supposed to go. Well, you know what you do? You take that one step. Take that one step. Take that one step. Do it. What's the thing you need to do? Who is it you need to reach out to? Who is it you need to call? Just take that small step. Remember, he was self-indulgent. He, he had become selfish and self-centered in Jerusalem. He'd become comfortable. As Americans, we struggle with comfort. It's one of our biggest uh, things that pulls us into sin. Now, let me tell you how not to ruin relationships with lust and pride. Because the truth is, when you're online, if you're not careful, your pride will show, your lust for things, your desire, maybe we call it coveting, will demonstrate itself by the way, maybe not the way you post, but the way you think about what you see. Does that make sense? If you see somebody doing something and you want to control them, and let's, say, let, let's say this crosses your mind. You see somebody's post online and you go, they are so dumb. You know what you just did? You put them here and you put you here. Right? It's so easy to do in life. Beware of angry posts that demonstrate pride. If you're posting things and your teeth are gritting... I hope before you hit enter that the Holy Spirit says, delete, delete, delete. Be careful of being jealous, jealous of others because jealousy really is lust. You want what they have. You know, somebody says something, I got a new car. And you can, you can number one, think, well, who do they think they are getting a new car? Or I can't believe they're spending money. I've seen their checkbook or whatever you're thinking. Right? Or you're thinking, I should have a car like that. They should. There's all these wrong motives that can rise to the surface. And online has made us very susceptible to that becoming normal. Be aware of how you feel when you're online. And I love this thing. I learned this from somebody. I think it was Rodney that was in AA. It's halt. So here's four things when you should be careful. Be careful when you're hungry. The Snickers commercial is correct. Did you know that? Be careful when you're hungry. Most fights, they've done several studies on this, happen before dinner. Did you know that? A lot of people get in fights right after dinner. Why? Your blood sugar's low. You're, you're hungry. Maybe you're hangry, right? So be careful when you're hungry. Be careful when you're angry. You ever said something you'd regret? You typically don't think that, say things that you regret when you feel I just love that person. That's not typically when you say something dumb. It's typically when you're trying to control something. You're trying to control a situation, a person, and maybe just part of your family is in on that, and you respond to them in anger, which has nothing to do with them. Be careful when you're angry. Be careful when you're lonely. When you're fe Everybody feels lonely sometimes. There was a study done years ago that said one-third of all married people constantly feel lonely. Loneliness has to do with you, not other people. Be careful when you feel lonely. And then finally, be careful when you're tired. Be careful when you're tired. Everybody's done something dumb when they're tired. Right? So be careful when you get tired. So those are the four things. Now, last thing on this list. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Learn how to really be grateful. 
When somebody says, hey, I got a new car, learn how to be like, you know what? That is wonderful. I love that person, and I'm so glad that they're getting good things in their life. And when somebody is hurting, mourn with them. Somebody came and told me something really sad this morning. And one of the hardest things for a pastor before church is when he hears something where he wants to help somebody. And all during service, all I can think is, oh, I wish I could go help them now. We should be that way with people where we care so much about them that when they hurt, we hurt. And that's normal. And that's good. Jesus wept, remember? And so it's okay. We should feel those emotions and know them. Okay, finally, number three. We forget that the world is temporary. 1 John 2.17 says, The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. I love that the world and its desires pass away. You know what that means? That in heaven there will no longer be temptation. In heaven, we won't have to deal anymore with this selfish gravity that even after we receive the righteousness of Christ, those old habits try to pull us back towards gossip and lust and anger and control and self-centeredness, right? All those things, people-pleasing, you know, all the things we fall into so easily are going to pass away. In the 50s, Jim Elliott and four missionaries went to Central America. They actually went to Ecuador. And they went to meet with a tribe. They had actually dropped uh, uh, gifts from a plane several times. And this tribe was known to be very violent, um, possibly even cannibals. And so Jim Elliott and these four guys were going to go, and several people tried to talk them out of it. And Jim Elliott, before he went, said these words. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Jim Elliott and those four people landed there. They got to meet with part of the tribe. And the next day they were killed by the tribe. A few years later, one of the sons went back. And then eventually Jim Elliott's wife and some other people went back and met with that tribe. And all of the people in that tribe became Christians. One of the people actually traveled and spoke quite a bit. It became awesome. But, but I remember being in chapel at my college and hearing Elizabeth Elliot's testimony. And she realized that her husband knew, hey, you're right. I might sacrifice everything, but I feel like this is what God wants me to do. And so he did it. We have to get to the point in our life that we realize, God, I don't want to live a life separated from you. I want to encourage you, when you get a chance this week, look at Psalms 51. And I'm going to focus just on these verses, but if you get a chance, read the whole thing. This is the psalm after David killed Bathsheba's husband, had him killed. The prophet Nathan got in his face, and David realized what he had done, and he wrote Psalms 51. This is a reason that David's a man after God's heart. And here's what it says. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. And then he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David did three things that we all need to do, and these aren't in your notes. Number one, he recognized the sin in his life. We need to take time out sometimes just to back away, especially when you're feeling angsty. You ever feel angsty? You know what I'm talking about? We're feeling frustrated. We need to take some time to back away and say, God, what, what is that? When you find that you, that you spout words that later you're like, ooh, what did I say that for? You ever say something and you thought, where did that come from? Out of the abundance of the heart, the Bible says, the mouth speaks. So we take time to say, God, would you show me Any sin in my life, sometimes it's a sin that nobody else will see. But it's an attitude, a way we think about people, a way we respond. And then take time to confess that. Just be honest with God. You know, the good news about Jesus is the Bible says that when Jesus died on a cross, the curtain of the temple was split. You know what that means? That means that Jesus goes straight to God and you go straight to Jesus. And you say, Jesus, this is what I've done. By the way, when you confess sin, God doesn't go, really? No idea. When you say, God, I'm sorry for this attitude I have, God doesn't go, I had no idea you had that. God already knows. 
The reason you're confessing it is why? To acknowledge it so that then you can do step number three. You confess it to him, tell him to change you, and then you receive his forgiveness. So you recognize sin, confess sin, and then receive his forgiveness. And what happens? He restores the joy. Are you missing your joy? Are you feeling frustrated lately, angry lately, irritated lately? Finding that you have a hard time loving people, maybe you've left your first love. And maybe it's time to say to God, God, I want to renew my first love with you. All this other stuff doesn't matter. May it all fade away. Now, there's some practical tips to doing this, resetting your focus, that I'm going to read real quick. Take time to be grateful for what you have. Sometimes just taking time for gratitude will change you. When's the last time you thanked somebody for some little bitty thing they did for you? Maybe it's the person who you got coffee from. Maybe it's somebody in the office who actually washes the dishes there. That's a shocker, right? Study and seek understanding of God's word. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've been reading the Bible where the Holy Spirit says, you know, here's an attitude that you have. I didn't even notice it until the Holy Spirit spoke to me through his word. Confess any area of sin to God every day. Take some time every day to just say, God, is there anything in my life, any impurity, anything where I've reached out and <laughs> and then finally, take a break from social media. Take some time away. Turn off the TV. Turn off the radio. Shut down your computer. Put a screen away. Put everything away and spend time and say, God, speak to my heart. If you're here today or watching online, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. Jesus came and died for our sins and rose again so that when we surrender our life to him, the Bible says he takes all those sins on him and gives us his righteousness. That's the reason we can have joy. And when, it, when that happens, his Holy Spirit comes into us. And so if you're here today or you're watching online and you're a Christian, the truth is the Holy Spirit, if you're paying attention, will speak to your heart. He'll not only show you the things where you blew it, but he'll remind you, the Bible says, he'll show you righteousness. He'll show you what to do that's right. So as you go through your week this week, you can say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. And God will lay people in your heart that you need to call. He'll show you things you need to do for others. So be sensitive to that. When you leave the love of the world, the love of God fills you. And it becomes natural to look for ways to love God's people. And to love the world that Jesus came for. So if you want to know more about what it means to be a Christian, I'd love to talk to you after the service or you can uh, talk to me online. If you're here today, you can, we don't pass an offering plate right now, but you can give and you can also give online if you're watching online. Um, Tuesday this week is Giving Tuesday. And if you give on Facebook, they are offering to match uh, starting at midnight, you know, that morning. Is that how you do it? Midnight Tuesday morning? Is that how you say it? Starting at 12.01 Tuesday morning. They, they're going to match up to, I think, a million dollars of people that give. And so if you want to give that way, it's a good way to double your giving, um, that you can do that this week. But we're glad that all of you give. We've been so blessed this season to be able to continue in our church, continue to do the things we're doing, and help others. Thanks for being here this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for your word and your power. Lord, I pray that uh, those who've been watching online, Lord, would be uh, blessed by what they've heard. Father, I pray that you'd continue to guide us through this season, that, Father, we would not put our eyes and our hearts on the world, but, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, change us, help us to confess our sins and have a right relationship full of joy with you. We thank you for these moments today. In Jesus' name, amen.